Hey folks, Travis Hill here from Dell Technologies and welcome to yet another episode of Talking Tech with Travis. I am joined today with my good friend and longtime coworker, Matt Baker, who is the Chief AI Strategist for Dell Technologies. And we are going to be talking about the lessons learned in the first year of generative AI. I hope you enjoy it. Stop talking to me about your widget. Start talking to me about my operating environment and how you bring it all together. So Matt, it's been a year since the shot heard around the world of ChatGPT. And, uh, you know, it's been quite a wild ride. Uh, you know, I remember a year to ago we were talking least. about everybody. Well, right, a year ago we were talking about everybody uh, customizing their, their own models and, you know, a bunch of stuff that ended up not happening. There's been a lot of experimentation this last year. From your perspective, what's the biggest thing we've learned from this year of experimentation? Well, we, we've certainly learned a lot. Um, I think you, you touched on one of the things, which is early on, folks had a very significant focus on models, 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 and everyone thought that they were going to build their own models, and, and in fact, build their own foundation models. And the reality is, is there's like a handful of people who can build foundation models. And in fact, when you go onto things like Hugging Face and you see all these models, there's hundreds of thousands of them. They are actually just derivatives of a handful of foundation models. So they're fine-tuned versions that speak French better, that speak you know, system code better, that do this, do that. Um, so that, that notion that everyone's going to be a model producer, I think, is something that we left behind very quickly. And in fact, not only that, we kind of left fine-tuning behind um, significantly. Now, there's still a big place for fine-tuning. Um, and that's something we're learning, but it's for a different reason than maybe we thought. Um, but what we really found was that these models, these large foundation models sort of built on publicly available data, were not terribly relevant or effective. Relevance the wrong word. They were not terribly effective out of the box for business use cases because they don't know about businesses. They don't know about things that are behind say, a firewall or within a company. So a lot of techniques that were developed in academia research and amongst you know, some of the great computer science companies in the world, those techniques were sort of brushed off and brought into the context of the enterprise. And that has led to what I think is this now entering into this year, making AI real by having learned how to infuse your own data into these AI applications. And we can get into the details of what those techniques are, but you know, we've gone from, we're gonna build models to a pragmatic way of adapting models for business use cases using a lot of other, interestingly, not generative AI techniques, but more traditional AI techniques like semantic search, graph search, and some of these other techniques that allow you to find the right data and then pass that through to a model to create some kind of good outcome. Yeah, and speaking of outcomes, you know, I talk to a lot of enterprises that are um, in the process of, of either experimenting, running a POC, or very early in the, you know, in the rollout of generative AI for specific use cases. And I hear four things uh, frequently. Um, I'm going to use it to, to my, make my coders more efficient. I'm going to use it as a services uh, or support assistant. I'm going to use it as a sales assistant. And I'm going to use it to generate it, uh, help me uh, more efficiently generate market, marketing content. And in every one of those cases, knowledge about that enterprise is critical to success. And so, you know, if you look at where we're at now and based on all the experimentation we did last year, what do you see customers doing right now to solve those issues? Well, I think that's a really good point. And I think that the, the sort of we learned a couple of lessons, rewind the clock further back, which was go back to big data, which was had the promise of doing what this era of Gen AI did. But we put the technology way out in front of the business problem. And I think what folks have learned that 
you know, you don't put techn technology in front of people and process. Technology is sort of the last thing to consider. So what you see right now is there's been a lot of experimentation to just get used to, okay, what's this stuff capable of, broadly speaking? And then folks are realizing, you know, I have a thousand ideas, but really I should narrow that down to a, a critical few set of ideas. And interestingly, the ones you mentioned are the ones we're internally focused on um, because they have, I think, the, the best, uh, they're basically shovel ready in terms of you, you've got the right processes, the value seems quite obvious based on the capabilities we've seen these things be, be able to do. And so they're focused on now building out a set of, hey, what are the right use cases to focus on? And then let's figure out what app, what, what technology to apply to it. Moreover, this is a lesson that we ourselves have learned internally is that, you know, you can put the greatest AI application on a really bad process and you end right. up with a doubly bad outcome, right? So a lot of what we found is, is that before you even add the tech in, going through and refactoring and modernizing your processes is a critical step one, right? So if you think about it, people and processes sort of go hand in hand. You've got to redesign the processes to yield the, the sort of effective savings of time and energy of your people. And then let's figure out how to turbocharge that with the technology. And that, I think, is an enlightened way to think about how to use this technology internally. And that's where we are starting to see customers get to. There's a class of what I would say is AI-infused tech companies that are rushing far ahead. But for, let's just say, a more traditional enterprise, a, a large multinational bank, a agriculture company, a this, a that, they're in that, I think, this phase of, our, let's, let's decide what we're actually going to go after and then let's build the capabilities from a technology perspective to allow us to benefit from that. And that seems to be where folks are. And I will say, though, I also think that the experimentation process at scale hasn't happened yet. So folks have mm -hmm. been using ChatGPT and sort of these packaged applications, but those, those have extreme limits because they don't have a lot of access to your data. So now they're like, all right, how do I do this at scale on premises with a lot of data? And so building up sort of what we found is there's a core set of capabilities that you have to build internally. Like the first one is, look, you probably need to create some sort of LLM serving cloud so that you can, in essence, drive all that demand through a gateway. You can monitor its usage. You can load balance the usage. You can you know, direct it to the relevant model for that type of use case. And ultimately, it's a service that you then turn over to developers who are developing the applications um, that are attacking those few use cases. So it's, I'd say we're not into the, you know, we're sort of, we've gone through the storming phase, we're in the forming, you know, mm. we're not quite yet to the performing, if you go back to that old framework of forming, storming, norming, and performing. Yeah, or, or to use a sports analogy, but we're in early innings, sports? right? We can't go, we can't, we can't have a podcast without a sports analogy. But That's true. We are in early. We're we're in early. I mean, maybe we haven't even started the game. I think yet. we're batting practice. Right, right. I mean, it's it's like we're figuring out where it makes sense. Yeah. Um, we have this handful of shovel ready use cases. Folks are are figuring out how to construct. Uh, a deployment that takes advantages of all of their uh, their data that much of it that yes. lives on premises still. That's right. And advantage of what's offered in the public clouds. So we're at at a pretty cool point in time, um, but I do feel like it's all you know all been a little bit of of, of prelude. You, you know, Matt, given what you do, given where we're sitting right now, we're sitting here a year from now. What happened over that period of time? What's next? Well, I think what we will have seen is sort of the, a build out of these core capabilities and sort of, uh, I would say, very quickly folks getting to a set of core services as an IT department. So let's think of this in, in sort of two personas. You've got the IT folks who are building services, and then you have practitioners, so data scientists, app devs, et cetera. I think as we go through this year, what we'll find is 
IT decision makers will be building up these core capabilities. Think of it as like a generative AI cloud capability so that their developers don't have to care about all of the infrastructure behind them. The IT team takes care of that. And then in essence, the developers, the practitioners, the data scientists can consume those services from within their own infrastructure and that they can build data pipelines that then feed these applications. So I think out the other side of this is that we're gonna, we're gonna take and go from a, an era of experimentation to building the sort of foundation of innovation for the company. And then we'll start to see a few of the floors and rooms getting assembled. We're not gonna get to the full house, right? The full high performance, everything, we've, we've figured this all out. But I think we're gonna get that foundation set and we're gonna start building our sort of innovation house for, for the company. Yeah. So Matt, I know you're, you're known a little bit for your, um, you know, for, for, as I like to say, zigging when everybody else is zagging. You, know, <laughs> you, you, you kind of uh, come out with uh, counterpoints when, when, when people are thinking all a certain way. What's your one bold prediction for this year? Kind of counterintuitive or, you know, maybe against the conventional wisdom. Well, I, th and I would say if it would have been a month ago, this sort of drumbeat that I've been talking about with smaller and smaller models, um, right. I think that that, that will be... Um, we, don't, we don't need LLMs, we need yeah, SLMs. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we need... And I think that the, the people are, are, are catching on to this because if these very, very large models, the largesse of the models tends to be the capture of more knowledge but that knowledge is not terribly relevant to your business case. And so, yes, they are maybe a little bit more perfect and flowery in their language or something like that, but we're finding amazing results with a combination of augmented generation like RAG or retrieval augmented generation with a really well built out pipeline, that whole RAG pipeline and the information retrieval part of it that's where the magic happens. The LLM is really doing the summarization and, and creating the, the human interface that's conversational and easier to understand. So we're finding results where you squeeze down like even a 7 billion parameter model, like a, a Mistral model, and combining that with an amazing RAG implementation, the results are awesome. And it's at a fraction of the cost and not just a fraction of the cost as in dollars, but a fraction of the computing complexity and therefore energy footprint and all of that stuff. So it's sort of like, okay, help me out here. <laughs> yeah. Bringing a jumbo um, jet to a, uh, to a Cub Scout um, soapbox derby. Yeah. How about that? Uh, a, a, a tractor trailer to take your kids to school. That's, per you, you got it. You got it. All right, <laughs> well, we, can Matt, edit, we can edit out that other thing. Okay. Well, Matt, it has been a, a true uh, joy having you here, known you for so long. It's always great getting to talk with you. Always enjoy your perspective. Uh, thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining another episode of Talking Tech well, with Travis. Well, thanks for finally having me. It took so long. Well, you know. Yeah. And we'll catch you next time.